Mike and I here again, and, and today we are we are especially excited to have Immersive Mind, Steve Stephen Reed with us. You can see the top of his head right now. Um, he is, oh no, you can see his, his, his beautiful face. Um, Stephen's gonna be going into <laughs> education edition and showing us some of the absolutely amazing work that he does, um, including the, uh, the refugee crisis uh, experience that he created in Minecraft, as well as Mathopocalypse, something like that, a math yeah. um, experience, and um, and Pompeii in the yes. uh, in his Minecraft toy Amazing. boxes, as they call them. So you're in for a treat, everybody. Amazing. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah. So <laughs> hi, everyone. I'm going to share my screen in just a second, but before we do that, I think it's just worth saying that the reason I chose this topic of building narrative is that there are We've been using Minecraft now for we're going into our 11th year of building educational experiences in Minecraft. And one of the things that's quite often um, apparent to me when, when people either come to me and ask us to build one or people have already built one, but it's not working in the way that they wanted it to, it's not getting the results with the students that they expected it to, um, is the, the fact that narrative is absolutely key to what to the whole experience and quite often it's missing quite often they've got beautiful structures or they've got great mechanics and the kids can do something with a you know a tool or they can they can press a button and something appears and fireworks go off or whatever and this is all great um but the narrative the story doesn't captivate the children uh, the characters that are in there and sometimes there aren't any and so what i want to show you in this live stream is what it looks like when we build, and I say we, I mean my, so I have a, a creative team plus many creative colleagues all over the world that are, um, that let me just get Minecraft up. There we are. I'm going to share Minecraft. That are that are doing this uh, sort of stuff. Now our primary focus is on Minecraft Education Edition, so I'll start there. Um, Steve and Mike, any questions? Anything you need me to do before I start? Man, I'm just pumped. So let's go. Yeah. Let's go. I just I just want to say one thing though, because for my students that are watching, um, I drill the importance of narrative. I teach game yeah, design yeah. and development, and I'm always talking about narrative and story yeah. in their games and all. So, um, so it is perfect to have you here to uh, reinforce what I'm already saying. It's just so important, um, and it kind of like it's the it's the ABC of of your making. You know, it's what takes children from the A to the Z. Of, of, of you know through their story otherwise it's i mean open world's great but but if you can give them and we're not talking strictly linear but we are talking about guidance and narrative and interest and the more questions for me the more questions a student has the better so when they get to a point they're like why is that happening so then we go find out or why didn't that work so then they go find out and it's those it's 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 the narrative for me ekes out those questions. So I think the world I'd like to start with is um, Mathpocalypse. So let me just find it. We have so many worlds. Um, what a great uh, name, by the way. Mathpocalypse, right? Um, so I'll give you a little look at what this looks like. This is um, a world that we built for a sister company called Fidgetal Labs, which is a stateside um, venture uh, using Minecraft to explore the curriculum across uh, the American, uh, the American. Curriculum. There we are. So let me just get to where we're supposed to start because this obviously I've been moving around in this world and we've had kids in it and so on. Um, I want to clear my inventory. Keep it in mind that uh, there's there's three things that I like to do when I um, when I develop a world. And that is the three the three ingredients, if you like. The first is. Uh, environment. So we have to think about the environment we want. I mean, if we're teaching something on desertification, for example, of, uh, uh, we, we want somewhere that's going to, some environment that's going to give us that feeling and, you know, maybe a desert biome or something like that. If we're teaching uh, something to do with deforestation, well, then we want a forest. And, you know, if we want an ocean biome because we're doing plastics in the ocean, we should, we should consider having a large ocean biome and so on. And that kind of goes without saying, but for a lot of beginners, they just start with a flat world or they just start with a random Minecraft world. And then the, the, the environment really fit with the lesson they had in mind. And so try to think ahead of, of your environment. The second ingredient is then the structures and mechanics. So what does the world look like? What do we need in it? So let's take this, for example, over here. Um, this is an, an island 
um, which I'll show you later how it looks. But this basically on this island, a little island here, and this is just a lighthouse which suggests the, the beginning of the level. And if the kids are to come down the mountain and make it onto this island, which many of them do, the first thing they do is go, oh, look, there's a lighthouse. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the children interested in what the world is before they realise it's a maths world. And when they look inside, they can't get in because it's all been boarded up and they can't work out why. And if they head round to uh, the other side, we can see in the window it's all been boarded up and they're not entirely sure why. So they can't get in there. And because this is an immutable world, which in Minecraft Education Edition settings means they can't do anything to the world unless they, unless we allow it using allow blocks, um, they can't really do anything with that. But it's, it's part of the mystery. It's the narrative and the story building. Why is there a lighthouse that we can't get in? Who's in there? Who used to live there? But where they actually start is with a, a crashed airplane. So this crashed airplane uh, has landed on the island. Um, in general, children will start right here beside our first character. This is where they would spawn, but I'm giving you the flying kind of look around it um, beside Dr. Wells, but the, 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 their plane has crashed. And of course, we deliver this narrative beforehand. So rather than having the kids just assume there's been a plane crash, we deliver either a little um, online piece of uh, resource, uh, learning resource, or we build a digital one around them that says, hey, your plane's crashed, you were on your way uh, to family for a holiday and your plane crashed on this island and it turns out there's a virus and that can be also be delivered by our little NPC here. So we get our little NPC and we will look at what he says. Uh, so I'm so glad you survived the crash. I hope you can make it to the city for the antidote to this disease. At which point the kids are like, well, what disease? And we're not talking about coronavirus. Um, one of the three paths follow a pattern and lead you through the forest to the train station. The others lead to disaster. So again, we're using narrative. We're using very simple words to kind of say to them, oh, there's been a disease. There's pattern paths through the forest. And if we take the wrong one, there's a disaster. Take this iron sword with you for protection and watch for zombies. So already they're thinking, oh, this is amazing. There's diseases and there's zombies. So we take, we press the button and we get a little sword. And then what we can do is we can head off. Now let's see what the blue, uh, the blue track does. So you'll notice there that we've got a blue track. We have a green track and we have a yellow track. And the kids see this and think, right, I'm going to do this. And they're countable. So what we're looking for is this is very basic. Key stage two, level three mathematics here in the UK. We're looking for pattern recognition. How do children recognize patterns? So one, two, three, four, five, six. So they note that down, number six. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Oh, that's good. So we've got a pattern, right? Six, 12. We can expect the next one to be 18. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So there's our 18, but the path continues. So by now, the kids should have recognised that this is not the path to go on. But if they're insistent, and it's and we've had kids say to us, no, there is a pattern. It's 6, 12, 22, then it should go back to 12 and then back to 6. So they, so they play with patterns in their heads. They play with numbers and they think they might have, have met, um, met a pattern. And in this case, they go deeper and deeper in. And as they go deeper in, they eventually come across zombies um, if I was in survival mode, we have zombies spawning randomly around here. And alternatively, they dive down into this hole where there's some zombies, there's one here, and they're stuck. They can't get back out and inevitably they will be um, eaten by the zombies and they get sent back to the plane to start again. Um, and so that's the first one. They know it's not the blue path. So then, of course, if they haven't already tried green, they try green, which we can also tell you doesn't work. And then if they try yellow, so what does yellow look like? Uh, they may do yellow first, which is great. So that's two, four, eight, 16. So now they start to recognize that they're getting this doubling up every time. So this should be 32. And then this eventually should take them to 64. Um, and we're getting them to recognize that doubling up as a pattern including the bridge here. And we've got it all locked down. So the way we've designed this specifically is that if they go into any path, there is no way they can make their way out of the forest um, to, the, to find another path. 
we very carefully put rocks in place and fallen logs and bushes and things so they can never quite find another path and but if they find if they get to the end of the correct path they meet mr matt has we've made it through the forest did my friend dr wells escape so we're creating this connectivity between characters so matt has knows dr wells and and you'd be, you'd be amazed how many kids say to me oh, Matt has knows Dr. Wells, and Dr. Wells gave us the sword, and they're they're already invested. They know that the story is something that they're a part of, and they've met two of the characters already. Um, I'll try to keep the zombies back, but we can't leave the island with the power out. So now we have a power issue. Head over to the station and uh, and uh, get the station back online. Head over there and find out the coordinate grid patterns. So they head over, and they can. Um, Follow this path and it's during this following the path that we have little secrets so underneath here there's a little cave and inside the cave they can find splash potions of healing and some rock odds to cook and so on um, and there's zombies down in the water and more zombies are spawning all over the place um, we have the way we've done this as a mechanic is real simple we just have a radius set so whenever they get to the end of the bridge three zombies will appear over here because there's a command block somewhere that says that um, and you can find out more about command blocks online. As you can see, kids have been playing this one and there are many, many, many zombies. In fact, if I switch to game mode survival, oh, get out of it. The babies are the worst, eh? Oh, uh, you're in trouble now. Oh, I'm in real trouble now. The babies are definitely right now. I need to get out of here. But here's the thing. So we're going to head into the power station. Stephen, I have a quick question. You build all of this stuff by hand, yes? You don't use like a world builder type mod or anything like that? Look at that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so we oh, they came after me way too quick, but we switched the electricity on in the pylon and we've created an electrical trap. I will answer your question in a second, Mike. I just wanted to make sure I was safe to do so. Actually, yeah. <laughs> ah, because there's another one. Safety first. One got in. Yeah, safety first. So yeah, we build all of this. So we have, we have builders that operate in different ways. So for example, um, a couple of my builders work exclusively in Java and they build it all using build tools like MC Edit and so on, and then we convert. Um, and then once we convert, it's then in Education Edition or Bedrock that we put in the, the tools, the command blocks, the redstone, you know, we make sure all of that works. Uh, the NPCs for sure, because they're only available in Education Edition. But we also have, um, we also have builders that build exclusively in in bedrock and they just you know in fact i've got one builder that builds everything on an xbox and he insists on doing it on an xbox and i'm like well no if you can, way honestly if you can hit the deadlines then do that for me and build right. our xbox experience stuff and you want to see him with a controller of course he switches to pc when i need him to but he just takes his controller with him you want to see wow. this it's unbelievable what he can do with the controller um, whereas everyone else, all my other builders are sort of mouse based or at least some of them, some of the younger ones are touch screen as well. But yeah, totally. it's a real mix. It all comes down to what, what my players really want want to do. Um, and so we meet our third character who's called Paula Lever, which is why I knew how to pull, pull that lever. Um, thank goodness you're here, an old Billy Connolly line. I've been reworking the electricity to power this train station and need your help. So then what you do is you head in. So we'll press this button. There we go. And that allows us in. And when we get in, the um, if I stand on these buttons, it will close again. In fact, I'll do that. Yeah. Oh, it didn't work. Probably because I didn't. I don't know what I did there, but it didn't work. I need to look at that. But normally the gate fixed. The gate's fixed. And there's a lever in there, but nobody knows what it's for because we're always creating mystery. Where we meet Vinnie Bolt and our next uh, lesson. So let me just show you how this lesson works. The redstone behind this was excruciating, is all I'm going to say. But we're looking for, again, we're looking for patterns. And so, and it's grid referencing this time. So we've created a grid on the floor of lights, which link to this door. And in order for us to get to the train station, we have to get out that door. Now, the other thing is the train station is locked and only opens if we manage to make this happen. So you'll see here that there's literally no way in to get to speak to Thomas Topham um, in the train station. That's awesome. So we have to go back and we have to um, we have to fix this. So let me show you how this works. So Vinnie Volt is going to have a word with us and say, look, I need help figuring this out. There's so many levers. I don't really know what I'm doing. Your pattern recognition skills will come into play. And they're already told that one, one will light up this light. 
So now we need a pattern. And this is where the kids start to get clever because the kids will go, right, I'm just going to press those. Nothing. So they know it's not any of those. And I'm going to press those. And they see that it's not any of those either. So, okay. Um, so what if it was diagonal? Nope. What if it was uh, there? And they're like, oh, there's another one. So that gives us one, one and two, three. So then what about, I just happen to know the pattern and then that would give us, oh, that's wrong. I say I know the pattern and then I get it wrong. Um, where are we? The, one, one. the redstone under this has got to be just unbelievable. Yeah. So as you can see, the kids, yeah, I'll show you it in a second. The kids work out that they have two, one, then they have one, two, then two, one, then one, two. So the next one should be seven, seven. So if we go to seven, seven, we get the next one. And then when we go to, so that means the next one should be one, two, and then two, one. And when we do that, we get, oh, that wasn't them all. I must have got this one wrong. Hang on, what was the last one? Oh. Yeah, it is. Now the zombie's out because this door opened. Help! Um, the zombies come out and get you. So then they have to make a run for this here. Now, the redstone, this is all done using, first of all, redstones that light up, uh, redstone tracks that light up these lights. But secondly, what was really important was that they all had to link to an AND gate because the gate will only open if this light and this light and this light are all lit up at once, okay? So we had to create, oops, let me just go into teacher mode. Um, if I could, an AND gate is a computer science thing where, in other words, the like Stephen said, the only way that would have happened is if all of these conditions were met. Um, so it actually, I mean, if the kids were creating this, you're teaching pretty sophisticated computer science as well. Yeah. Um, and so this is the this is the background. So you can see the redstone there links from the the, the wall, the, the lever wall, and then goes down. And it actually goes two different ways. It splits here, each one. So each one comes from the wall and splits. This one goes okay. down to the lights. So that will light up the appropriate light. And then yeah. this one goes to an AND gate. And as you can see, we have it all here. And then it goes AND all the way down until eventually it feeds down to one which then is the one that opens the door. And only when all of these gates are open, when all of these are active, does this light at the end light up, which then allows for the door to be opened. So, yeah, never, ever, ever commission me to do something like that again. <laughs> I'm, I'm putting that out there. It was a headache. But it was actually really magic to work on, to be, to be honest, because it was when we saw it, you know, when you see it work, it's fantastic. Um, I, have, I have some students that'll do it for you next time, Stephen. Exactly. That's what I should have done. I should have been clever about that. And of course, now we're out and we're heading for the train station. And it's at this point we get to the train station and Thomas Topham says, oops, that's because I'm in uh, teacher mode. Thomas Topham says, help, help, help. I'm so glad you were able to power the rails, but can you build a way around the barricades, fight the zombies and get the mine cart? Because there's not a mine cart. Now, you have to look at the clue in here. He says, once you've got the mine cart, make the right choice. Now, in here is where the minecart is. It's been barricaded in and the people have been infected anyway, so there's no, no use. And you have to go in and find the minecart. But when you get it, you'll notice that there's two tracks. If you take the left-hand track, and I'm kind of letting spoilers go here, but you don't have to tell your kids this, you will plummet into the sea because the, uh, the bridge is broken. But if you took the right choice, you would head off and you would go straight into the train station where you meet Conductor Clarabel. And Conductor Clarabel basically says, the stairs to the exit of Platform 3 have crumbled. Can you collect them? And so what you have to do is this has allow blocks underneath, you'll notice. These are build allow, these golden blocks are build allow blocks. It's the only place we allow the children to build in this world. And that's because we need them to build a set of stairs to get up to Cliffhanger up there. And once they build they have to obviously use the wood which has fallen down from the roof to create a, a crafting table and then use the stone to make stairs and then follow this pattern all the way up to the top and it's all to do with math so what we, we encourage the teacher to do in the written instructions for this is to create a, 
a path, a, a plan elevation and side elevation. How many stairs are you going to need if you know that you need to get this height in this length? So then the students work it out. We've given them a, a visual for the younger children for differentiation, but usually the children would work it out for themselves. We've had kids that have built right up to the point. So let me show you what that would look like in stairs. I'll just use brick stairs for the purposes of this demo. But we have, we've had children that have built right up to the point. We've also had children that have miscalculated the mathematics and they've, they've been one short. Um, and so they end up with their stairs here, for example or here because they started too, way too early and so on. And so it's a really nice exercise in getting them to work out their, um, their X and Y coordinates in relation to height and width. Once they get to the top, they get to Cliffhanger who says, you made it. We've been waiting for our hero uh, like you. Somewhere in the city is a medical facility with the antidote. And here's what that looks like. Let me show you what that looks like from here. This is the end of chapter one. We're currently in the development of chapter two. But if we head outside, there's a city. And inside this city, somewhere in this ravaged city, zombie apocalypse city, there is a facility. And But if we take a closer look at what that looks like, you'll see that the entire city is held in the hand of a giant dead arm, a zombie's arm. And it turns out this whole time you've been on an island that looks like a giant hand and the island that you were on was the arm. And the kids love that. When they finally fly up and they're like, wow, we're in a giant zombie's hand. And it just, that's the environment and the, uh, the structures I was talking about earlier. And all of these ingredients make for a, a wonderful experience for the kids because they've had the narrative, they've empathized with characters, they've fought against trouble, dangers, whether that's puzzles or, or, or enemies. And they've also done it in a captivating environment and they've also played around with mechanics that make them wonder, like, how did the door open? Because I made all those lights light up and so on and so on. So that's 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 our first sort of narrative adventure. Anybody got any questions before I move on to the next one? There were some questions in the chat. Um, I think Go. we covered most of them. How how do we get access? How do teachers get access to these these lessons? And I, sure. I think we we send them to the the digital lab slash lessons. Is that is that the right way to send? Yeah, so get access every, to the stuff? not everything is digital labs. Some of it's immersive minds, and I'll and what I'll do right. is I'll make that apparent as I go through. Some of my stuff is free. So the next thing I'm going to show you is the refugee crisis, which is way more serious than the math stuff, but equally as important. Um, and that is free, and I can link you to that as well. I think what we'll do is we'll just make sure that we put out a series of links either, you know, however you want to do that, Mike, I'll make sure everybody has the links to get access to the things that we're yeah. looking at. Yeah. I'm going to be posting this on, on my class YouTube channel as well after, so I could add any of that. Um, and if you could do me one favor, Stephen, yeah. could you say good morning to Melissa Renchi? Good morning, Renchi. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Did you want me to say that in 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 Scottish? In Scottish, did you, you did say it in Scottish, didn't you? <laughs> well, I could also say it in Gaelic. I'm not sure I could say it in Gaelic actually. Our lost language, which I don't miss an opportunity on a live stream to tell the world that it was banned until the 1960s, and you could be hung for speaking it for many hundreds of years. Oh wow! Fact, we're now speaking it again, and we're teaching it in schools, and it's uh, it's back. So. I just don't really know how to speak it because I was part of a generation that wasn't allowed. Now, do you have um, a Minecraft lesson on Gaelic? Yes, yet? we do. We actually have. Uh, now, I can't show it because it's not an education edition. It's actually on Java. But we did build St Kilda, which was uh, six stories about our Scottish heritage on the island of St Kilda, which is an island on the west coast, um, which is uh, a, a beautiful island on the west coast. Um, which was abandoned in the 1930s after being after having humans on it since the the Iron Age, and the reason it was abandoned was because of modernity, hot showers, food. Um, during the wartime, the soldiers arrived on the island and said to the kids that lived there, "Hey, you don't want to live here eating birds' eggs. We've got showers and we've got baths and we've got you know food and we've got theatres and you know pubs and." And so all the young people were like, oh, we need to leave. So we built the entire thing in Minecraft one to one scale. And we told six stories ranging from the Iron Age through to the very last person that left the island on the boat, um, the HMS Harebell. And the kids in Scotland are able to go and learn their heritage through Minecraft by following those six stories. Where, um, it, 
I was just going to ask when when uh, when we were in Scotland, you took us to um, I think it was a was it a hotel that's um, that you've recreated completely in Minecraft for them, right? Yes, yes. Where was that? That was amazing. Yeah, well, I also that's also in Java edition, but we are working on having them all sw swapped over. But that was the Athol Palace Hotel with a remarkable right. history. So it was a it was turned into a school during the first and second world wars, so that children from London could get away from the bombing, and we built it as a school. Uh, we it was also the host of a very prestigious um, Victorian wedding, and we had we, so we built the wedding inside Minecraft, and right. kids could attend the wedding and stuff. So. Um, and yeah, when you were over in Scotland, Steve, I drove you to the hotel and kind of showed you what it looked like. Yeah, and it was neat seeing the uh, the actual hotel and then seeing it right in the lobby in Minecraft was pretty remarkable. Yeah, yeah. And so um, let me introduce you. I'm going to keep this one short because I want to show you lots of other sort of things. But this one is our refugee crisis. We are a big believer in, in immersive minds. Part of our values and ethics is games for good. And we believe uh, particularly games for social good and games that uh, building game experiences or using games to help those that are most in need in the world. And so in 2015, at the height of the European refugee crisis, um, thousands of people were dying in the Mediterranean trying to make it from war-torn countries. Um, we're still suffering the after effects of that now, as are they as refugees. And some of them are still trying to, trying to come to Europe. And we decided that we needed to clarify some of the things, help to, 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 to kind of clarify the narrative around this. Because one of the reasons, and I'm very passionate about this, one of the, one of the reasons I did it in the first place was because I, we, we got talking about it in a school um, discussion with kids, young kids, 11 years old, 10 and 11 years old. And one little boy looked me right in the eye and said, ah, they just come over here and they take our jobs. And I said to him, well, first of all, you're 11 and you don't have a job. And secondly, where did you hear that? And he was like, my dad. And then we got talking about, I said, so what else do you think about, you know, refugees coming in? And the kids were like, yeah, they come over here and they've got diseases and they come over here and they take our jobs. And it's the only reason they want in is because we have health benefits. And, da -da -da. and I was like, wow, no one is actually talking about the whole picture. Everyone's just talking about the issue it causes. And so even the news, you know, you could follow the BBC or ITV or any other of the news channels. And it was just like, you know, more refugees try to enter Britain, blah, blah, blah. And I was kind of like, let's talk about this. Our company is not here to tell children whether they should be, you know, they should be politically aligned one way or another. But let's let's talk about the world's issues. Let's talk about refugee crisis, hunger, gender equality, poverty, um, you know, clean water access. Let's talk about these things. And so what we did was we developed a narrative it took us three years to develop a full narrative working with refugees working with ngos uh, working with governments to develop this narrative that allows children to be refugees so children start in this village you can see helicopters and there's explosions and the fountain's been destroyed and what they do is they start with their granddad here and this comes with a full um one note document that you can tap into and it takes you through everything it's now effectively being used in 53 countries uh, worldwide with great results in uh, uh, sweden wales uh, france uh, germany and so on so granddad starts by saying you know similar similar concept to the maths world oh you're still here your parents have gone ahead to arrange safe passage for you but they haven't returned i mean that alone is a reality for some kids their parents go and never come back and also granddad can't go with them and it was amazing just this first statement to have the kids like one little girl said to me but granddad has to come with us and i said well why and she's like because i would want my granddad to come with us and i said but what if he can't and these are real tough subjects that the children in your classrooms um i know that lanny watkins who's one of the, the great mies of the uk um he ran this with his class because he has children from syria in his class and he wanted his parents his, his children to be able to um to relate, to, to empathize. Um, they then have to grab, they're told by granddad to grab three things. And this is amazing. We've got things in there like a map, a compass, an apple, a birth certificate, extra clothes, string, a fishing rod, a family photograph, a feather and some money, i.e. an emerald and diamond. You would be amazed how many kids, because they can only take three, grab a fishing rod, some string and an apple. And I'm like, okay, are you sure those? that's what you want to take? They're like, yeah, yeah. Definitely. And I'm like, not your birth certificate. No, no, 
not a family photograph? No, definitely not. Not any money? No. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So we discussed that, of course. These are all discussion points in the resource. Why take what you take? Um, then they head over to John and John's like, hey, you need to go to this part of the village. And that kind of leads them out there. And there's a whole discussion around there about who to trust. Do we, do we trust? You know, you don't have parents. Granddad can't go with you. Some guy called John in a car park told you to go to this address. You know, you're 12 years old. This is this is worrying. And of course, we have tanks and we have soldiers like that, look like American GIs. Simplify. Um, and then over here, we have Sven, a police officer. So then there's a whole discussion around here about... Um, do you trust someone in a uniform just because they're a soldier or a police officer or, an, or a doctor or a nurse? Um, and then he says, basically, you made it so far, you now have to get to the harbour. Now, what they don't realise, and this is one of the harrowing parts, because we believe if we're going to talk to children about this, we have to talk about the reality. This is a minefield. And if children cross this, it detects them and mines underneath the ground blow up. And some kids don't make it. Some kids die in Minecraft and they, and they say to me, oh, we'll just respawn. And I say to them, no, you won't, because that's not what happened in the med. Um, and we have a discussion about that. At which point, those who have made it um, meet Chorbion. Those who don't make it, they become journalists. So they're not out of the game. They just become paper journalists and they have to look at, we have this whole journaling course that sits with it and they have to look at press integrity and they have to look at reporting fake or real news the language that's used, the, um, the the localisms, they have to look at how they write with their literacy system, they have to look at accompanying pictures, so they use the camera built in and they do a whole journalism piece around it and they become the narrative writers. Um, Tjorbjorn says, look, too many of you, so this is where the teacher works out, if they have 10 kids that made it to the port, they only have five boats and those boats can only take one person, for example. And so who do you leave behind? And this is a really difficult discussion for kids because kids very often will go, well, I'm going because, well, because I should, but they can't say why they should. And then we start looking at, well, do you send women first? Do you send men first? Because there's this idea that, you know, men will go and be able to do more manual labor, which will make money and send it back to the kids back home. And it's kind of like, really, is that is that true? Um, and then some kids are like, well, I've got more money, so I could just buy myself onto a boat. And then we start looking at inequality and so on. What makes a human a human and what makes human rights human rights? And so they then get in their boat and those who don't get to go become journalists. And so we're slowly eliminating um, the, the, the children in, in their roles. And then eventually we get to a trafficked boat where we have many, many, many um, of these people. And they talk to a trafficker who is ruthless. They talk to a trafficker who's doing it because she thinks she's doing the right thing. And then we talk to somebody being trafficked. And this is a Malik is a real case um, that the United Nations built. You can watch a video about her. They, they built a story around her actual story um, of, of being a refugee. It's, it's harrowing, but it's, it's wonderful um, content. At which point we reach a crossroads and teachers can decide if they want to do one, two or all of these. The first is being a refugee. They get off the boat. They sign in at the border guard and they get put in a refugee camp and a sorting uh, space. And it's here that they start to learn about what refugee camps are like and what it means to have the right documents. Oh, a wolf died. I don't know why. Probably drowned. Um, once, they, once they're out, whether it's because they've been processed or they've escaped through a hole in the fence, they can then look at education, housing, employment, public services, health care. Like, what does that look like as a refugee? Do you just have automatic ex access to law enforcement? If somebody commits a crime against you, can you just go to the police and report that? What about employment? Who has the right to get a job and what sort of job? Can you just enter the country and go work in your local supermarket, um, etc.? Once they've finished that one, they can then come over here and look at housing. How do we house these people? How do we put people that are new to our country in housing um, that's fair and adequate. And in this case, this was one of the designs one of our kids made using shipping containers by looking at human rights and the space that a human needs to live. And then, so we've got an engineer, we have a refugee and we have an artist talking about these things should be aesthetically pleasing and so on. Or there's a big wide space here for them to design their own and the kids come up with all sorts of amazing things. And then over here, we have the statistics. So kids can quite literally come over and say, you know, in 2015, in Greece, 
almost a million people entered the country. But at the same time, in 2015, uh, there were 5,000 deaths in the Mediterranean trying to reach Greece. And so they can start to look at the statistics just by looking at these bar graphs that we've made. And then finally, and this takes us to the very end of the, the narrative, uh, it's a safe space. So the children then get to go to this safe space inspired by a real project in Sweden where there are black shipping containers called safe spaces that relate to all of the human rights um, uh, the Convention of Human Rights, and this one's number three. Every child, everyone in the world has the right to be safe and secure. Uh, it was started by Raoul Wallenberg, who was a Swedish man who was basically the Swedish um, uh, Oscar Schindler. He rescued many, many, many Jews um, across, the, across the sea and into Sweden during the Second World War. And what the children are encouraged to do in here is build what makes them feel safe. Kids build their homes, they build their bedrooms, they build their parents, they build teddy bears. They build all the things that make them feel safe. And it's really amazing to see the difference between what our children build, i.e. our safe, secure British or American or French yeah, children yeah. build, compared to what the refugees build, which is really remarkable. And then when they're finished, this is the, the real crux of it, they can go in and they can go to this little export, 3D export, and they get to build, they get to 3D print their safe creation, which will have been built inside here, and it prints off super small, and then they stick it on a key ring, and they get to take it everywhere. And it's a reminder oh, to all children that took part that you have this safe space that no one has the right to take away from you. Um, and, it, and it goes on a key ring. And every child that takes part gets one. So way more serious than math apocalypse, but actually, no, if you think about it, for some children, they're in that math apocalypse you know trying to make their way from one country to another and so as a company we develop this narrative and children love it they genuinely love it um a lot of people have said to me are you sure children want to play this and i'm like trust me children absolutely love it they love thinking about it talking about it debating over it and it really gets them thinking and the main thing for me is that i don't i don't necessarily expect to be the man to make somebody change the way they think about something but at least think about it um so, any questions on this one? Move on to the next. Final. There was a there was a question about the three D printing um, yes. and uh, and about how you get it to print. Well, the question is how do you get it to print super small? Is the actual question in the in the chat? Yeah, so that's about scaling using the slicing uh, uh, software that comes afterwards. So you would take that build using the, the, the structure block. And then what you would do is you then automatically have to run it through something like um, a 3D Builder to, to get it into the file that type that you want, which is an OBG or a, an STL. Um, feel free to contact anyone in the community that does this, particularly me, and I'll, I'll help you with that. Um, details, obviously, to follow after the stream. But once you've got it in that software, you can scale it. You just right. it's, and it, it's a case of just clicking and dragging, and you can say I want it this size or that size, and the and the 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 software will tell you this is going to print at four millimeters, and you're like, wow, that's way too small. This yeah. is going to print at ten centimeters. That's what I want, and you can scale it using the software. It's a basic resize function in the in the in the three D printer software. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just a scaling piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, for sure. So we've done math apocalypse. We've done uh, refugee crisis. Let's have a look at our. Let's see, there's there's two more I want to take you through. One is our art Pompeii. world. Pompeii, Pompeii. Oh yeah, we'll do Pompeii last, like super last. Um, but this one is our art world, and the reason I wanted to show this is because this is my um, jam. By the way, this is my favorite thing in the whole world. I love this one. Good. So the reason we did this was because we were challenged, actually. We wanted to write a curriculum for a whole host of, you know, we wanted to do math, literally, literacy, science, and so on. And we have loads of these worlds. But one, we were challenged by a group of art teachers that basically said to me, come on then, show me how art can be used. And apart from the usual stuff, you know, when you talk to teachers about things like, well, you could do, um, you know, you could do side elevation, you know, elevation, side elevation and plan drawings. You could get children to do pixel art, that kind of stuff. It did challenge me. It did get me challenged. And I thought we should build an art world. And so, uh, for, again, for the digital worlds, we did. And what happens is they start in an art gallery. They start in this lovely, gorgeous art gallery. And then they can go over here and they can say, I want to see Michelangelo and the Masters. I want to see Claude Monet or I want to see P.A. Mondrian. 
And so if they choose to go and see Michelangelo and the Masters, we can literally go in and we can see the paintings from the classics and they can find out who did them and when. The Kiss of Judas, Giotto de Bondone in uh, 1306. And the resources that come with this, there's our Mona Lisa, um, and the resources that come with this are, um, help you to kind of look at what these were, and there's questions around them. So there's things like, moving closer to the images allows you to see the pixels that make them complete. This is part of the digital reproduction process. The real paintings themselves, however, are not pixelated. Can you make a picture using pixels? Um, this one over here is, one of these paintings is missing a date. Can you find the painting and research when it was created? who created it and what it was. And so there's a lot of little sort of like puzzles to go and do things. I mean, if you look at the Last Supper here, if we move in on Jesus's face there, you can see how pixelated it becomes, but from afar, it looks great. Um, one of the questions, of course, is there for the creation of Adam. How many pixels is God's finger to Adam's? And it's three, I reckon. Three pixels away. Um, however, once they're finished, they then get encouraged by these, uh, again, narratives. So they're following narrative, they're being told where to go, and then they head into a one to 17,000 scale recreation of the Sistine Chapel. And they meet Michelangelo himself. And Michelangelo has a book, um, who basically, the book in there says, here's who I am, here's what I do. These are my contemporaries, and they can learn a bit about him. Um, he had never painted a fresco before he was asked to do it, which I thought was, I didn't know that, it was remarkable. He lived until he was 89, so we can learn about um, Michelangelo in that book. And then the job is to explore the frescoes. So if we head up and we look along at the frescoes, we can see how pixelated they are, but they do in fact make up the real frescoes in the Sistine Chapel. And then when they head to the roof and the ceiling, their job is to make the ceiling as my Stephen, We're getting a question in <laughs> chat about how you import the paintings into 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 your world, into Minecraft Education Edition. Can you is there like a quick way to explain that a little bit without um, getting into like the weeds? Because I know it's a little weedsy. It's it's very weedy. Um it's it's very weedy and actually it's it's huge more than weedy, it's just time consuming. Yeah. Um, we there's third party softwares and what we do is we do it in java first and then we convert the paintings by number into bedrock and then we take the paintings by number we give them back to ourselves using a code and then we put them on the wall in the order that we were given them <laughs> it's not it's not easy it's, it's just not easy them. i knew i knew the answer was kind of a hard yeah, yeah thing to explain in in a in a so stream, but yeah, it's, it's, is if I can ask also, because I think I I've seen this, I think like Jennifer Avery um, did this uh, with, does this with a lot of her paintings. Maybe there's a software, you bring the picture in and it pixelates it. And then almost like a count by numbers, you literally are still building it block by block. There, well, yes, that's another way of doing it. So for the really big ones, um, which I'll show you shortly for the really big ones, we, took the picture, pixelated it, put it into Minecraft, then we mapped it using maps. So you can use a, you get an empty map and you hover over the picture. So effectively we had to make these huge pictures pixelated one to one, uh, well, one, uh, 25,000 to one scale. So we were like the size of a fly. And then we had to take map photographs of them and then put them on the wall. So yeah, it, th there's there's like three or four different ways you can do it. And they all, it just depends what your intended outcome needs to be. And right. people so the, like, oh, don't be daft, it's easy. Well, it, <laughs> it can be if you just want to throw a picture out there and have the kids sort of ooh and at it. But if you want to build it into something like this and you really want it done right and professionally and sort of something that the kids can really get their teeth into, it does take time and you have to be prepared for that. Yeah. And the, the part that you're placing on the walls then, is that the pieces of the different maps, like a number of maps to make it up? Like you it's, might have 20 maps to make up one picture. Yeah. As I head back through, I'll show you what that looks like. But the idea of this lesson is for the kids to then paint the roof using blocks. And we don't okay. care what they paint it with. They don't have to paint <laughs> right. the Sistine Chapel. Some of them put minions and space invaders and all sorts of things on the roof. All I Ooh, care about is they did it like that. So yeah, if we go to the Mona Lisa's face here, if we if I right click, you'll uh, see yep. it rotates because they're maps. Got it. That is amazing. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's a that's a panel or that's a, a frame, an item frame, and then a, and then a map in it. Yeah, yeah. so you there it is. The the wow, yeah. that's how we plan. Yeah, <clears throat> um, unbelievable. It's just hugely time consuming. Um, if we head into number three, you'll see that what we now do is we meet P. A. Mondrian, and I'll keep this super short just because of time. But basically, you can see your P. A. Mondrian paintings. The kids do a lot of activities to do with P. A. Mondrian, but then in this case, they then go into the last task which is a physical painting one, because we asked them to physically paint um, while lying upside down to do the Sistine Chapel, where they paint the bottom of their school desks with paper wrapped on it. In this one, they go inside a completely immersive P.A. Mondrian. And the idea is that every child picks their, their, their angle. So say that was my angle, and then I get a canvas and I physically paint that scene as a, as a P.A. Mondrian. Meanwhile, another kid decided that's their angle. And another kid has decided that's their angle and so on. And so you should end up with every single child has a different PE Mondrian by the time you're finished using Minecraft as a, an immersive sort of PE Mondrian scope um, visual. And then if we head through to the final one, this is Claude Money. And we meet Claude Money, and he's just like, hey, welcome, and I'm this guy, and these are some of my paintings. He does, I mean, he was an impressionist. He did gorgeous, gorgeous paintings, my favourite being this one over here. Um, and then if we look over at his self-portrait. So this was done in um, 1886, self-portrait. But then if we head outside, you'll see that this whole time, we've just been the size of a fly inside his studio, and the entire gallery is actually just a model. And we're inside his paintings, uh, in, sorry, inside his, his um, gallery. And these are the giant paintings that we had to recreate um, using block by block. One to, you know, one to uh, 13, I think these are 12 or 13,000 to scale. Plus they have glass layers over the top. So we can get much more breadth of colour if you add glass on top of colour. Uh, blocks and that created his paintings and then around this the kids have to then solve the mystery of who he was so there's a self-portrait over here as you can see that's a recreation of his self-portrait but then they have to find the actual picture of him so this is what he looked like and there's a little Claude Money asking questions there he loved coffee there's a wedding ring on the table there's a letter but to whom um, there's a painting on the wall here but it's not a money what is it it's also a girl with a parasol, but it's not a money. So the kids then have to go and explore, you know, find out who his contemporaries were because this is a painting like his, but it's not his, um, and so on. And then to boot, there are four ninja turtles that the kids have to find. Where is it? There we are. There's one. So there's Leonardo, and the other three are hidden around, and they have to find that. And you'd be amazed. That's awesome. Kids, why are the Ninja Turtles? And I'm like, well, let's find out. And then they find out, of course, that they were named after great artists. So that's our painting. That's our art one. And we were challenged by art teachers to create a world that, that gave children a reason to want to think about Claude Mott. Because let's face it, I mean, I did my major is in art. And art history was not my favourite part of the subject. I did not want to learn about P.A. Mondrian and John Constable. And, you know, that wasn't that wasn't my flavour of, of study. But this makes children want, like, who was he? What did he do? Look at that painting! And so on and so on. And they love it. And it's about following that narrative in this gorgeous environment. The The scale of this is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I, I I can't get over how, like, you're in you're in that art um the art gallery to start and you already think it's like this big giant gorgeous room and you're not even close to being like in the scale of the entire project well, yet like yeah. when you showed me this like last year it was about a year and a half ago i guess at this point my head exploded like i just <laughs> couldn't believe what i was looking at it's one of the most impressive things i've ever seen built in minecraft not like like i mean you can go on youtube and watch tons of youtube videos and stuff like that of cool stuff it's it's right up there with everything else i've ever seen it's the most amazing thing i've it's it's astonishing it's to me you yeah. know, and the, the thought and purpose behind it is so amazing as yeah. well. I mean, and I think that's what we're talking about, too, today is like, like, this isn't just let's do art in Minecraft. It's like, let's, um you know, really get kids to dig into 
art, yeah. you know, and, and all. It's awesome. And, and the good news is we're moving all of this content over to Bedrock and it will be available for every child anywhere in the world on the Bedrock Minecraft marketplace soon. So kids can can hop in and buy this, uh, you know, anytime they like. Um, but with an educational twist, we're not going to make it purely marketplace content. We're going to be making it educational and we hope to be able to have children all over the world saying, actually, I'm going to download this because I want to learn about Pompeii, um, as opposed to I'm going to download, you know, Sky Wars and I'm going to go to war with my friends um, type thing. So we're hoping to, to sort of have that available for people. Yeah. And then to finish, in terms of narrative, it doesn't have to be, everything I've showed you so far has been one long narrative, like full art gallery or a full math apocalypse or something. This is our toy box series. And we have World War One. we have the Victorians, medieval Scotland, in this case, Pompeii, we have the Egyptians, um, we have hydroelectric power and renew renewable energies. And they're basically giant dioramas built in these huge toy boxes. And then we have multiple narratives. So one of the narratives that you can follow in this is what happened when the volcano erupted. And you can erupt the volcano using redstone. You can use code builder to create the ash falling and so on. Um, you can speak about farming and you can look at agriculture and follow an agricultural narrative. You can look at marketplaces and you can see what it was like to be a merchant in those days. You can look at religion and follow a religious narrative. You can look at and you know the, the, the Roman gods. You can look at politicians. This was their oratory where they would stand and talk um, and, and vote on things. And we can look at the, the history of Roman democracy and Roman uh, things. You can go and look at entertainment and culture. So in here we have bathers in, in, their, in, their, in their, their baths. You can look at literature and, and, sorry, literacy and the root of words. So com means together, C-O-M, com together. So when we look at one of the branching words for that would be community or communism or communal and so on, is to be and act a group of people together. And, and then we get the kids to strip off the signs and make their own ones. So what other root words come from the Latin, which we still use today? And so the kids can then look at the, the root language. Um, we have a theatre where the children can actually make a, a Roman play, and then they can 3D print that. So if I just head down here and have a poke in here, you can 3D print the play and the kids can take it away with them and they can actually make a play happen inside here and we also have a schoolhouse uh, which is further down here did you know it's out here to finish the pedagogus or the pedagogus <laughs> was a person a slave who was assigned as the uh, the accompanied rich children to school and their sole job was to make sure that the child paid attention and learned and listened the teacher would give lesson, and then the pedagogus would sit with the child and say, did you understand? Let's do this together. They were also the only person outside of the family allowed to lift their hand to children in chastisement. And the word ped pedagogy comes from that role. Um, so when we talk about the pedagogy of learning, it comes from the Latin for pedagogus, which, which was a slave. Um, whose task was to help our children learn. And then in here, just to finish, we have gladiators. And it's these gladiators, uh, you can, the children can play the, um, the emperor. So the emperor, once you're in the arena, the emperor seals the gates. <laughs> and then when they press this button, they can summon, um, they can summon gladiators. And then we can see how many students survive. <laughs> <laughs> and, they make, and they make the gladiators appear. Just a bit of fun, but it's all about exploring that part of their culture. What was gladiatorial arenas? Why did they do it? Um, and so on. And there's actually a remarkable history around that, um, around using games to stop people suffering from hunger. Um, so when the empire was struggling in times of famine or drought, they would hold games every few days and the people would be distracted. They would say, right, you don't eat or drink during the games. Um, but afterwards you do, and it would give the city time to replenish their stocks because there would be games. Um, so interesting history. Uh, we've also got an orchard down here. And so the idea behind these toy boxes is that you can follow multiple narratives. So you might have 
a history teacher who thinks, I just want to do Vesuvius. And then you might have another teacher that's like, actually, I want to do politics and democracy. And I have another teacher that says, I want to do the mathematics of getting water to and from cities and so on. And so teachers can pick and choose what they want to learn within our worlds. Um, and so we still got a few minutes left if you want me to show one more toy box briefly, or shall we stop for questions or? We're, we don't have a lot of questions right now. So if you want to, if you want to show one, uh, one more, we probably have a there few was, minutes more. There was some interest in seeing um, Pompeii erupt. Oh. Um. <laughs> Actually, I think Steve just wants to see, make sure we yeah, see Pompeii yeah, yeah. erupt. Yeah, no, I'm not so, going to do that. Maybe, some maybe interest. Do that well, we can hold off on that. But we did, we did have a, a pretty amazing experience, if, if I recall, Stephen, a few years ago, where um, where you did you win a, a Guinness World Record, if I, I if did. I recall correctly, <laughs> for um for the Guinness World Record at, at Mind Fair 2015 or 16? 16. That was our very first one. 2016. I ran I used the Pompeii map to run the largest history lesson Ar I, uh, yeah, or architecture I think it was, it was right? the largest architecture lesson anywhere uh, anywhere that had been conducted anywhere in the world yes and I and we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students in this massive massive hall yep and I used Minecraft to teach them about how the Romans had built using putt lockers and um, insulated wall systems and so on and we won we and the Guinness World Record uh, came along the, the, the group came along and they monitored us and they gave us the award so we we yeah. and then it was beaten I think by children a year and a half later oh was it uh, yeah, we could do that. but, but we, we we did have the eruption in that lesson we did, yes. We erupted and it, it at the end and the kids went crazy. Yeah, they yeah, yeah. Out of them, yeah. Um, so this one I wanted to finish on is the Vikings, just to give you another example. So if I head out here, you'll see that we have a Viking toy box. This one's actually held in a nice wooden sort of sarcophagus type nice. thing. And then if we head over to, um, if we head in here, we have a series of activities. So there's, again, there's farming, there's shipbuilding, there's the longhouses, there's weaponry, there's mythology, there's an ice cave up here where they can go and find an ice giant, um, uh, one of the Jutenheim, uh, there we go. So the, And there he is, actually. We have an ice giant in there with his, with his runes on him. Turn around and have a look at me, boy. Don't be frightened. Um, we also have dwarfs and... Um, if I go in and get a golden, where is it? Spawn the golden boar. So we have Freya's golden boar. Oops, let me just be a, stu uh, a teacher at this point. We have a uh, golden boar. So that's, and you can get on that. That's rideable. Uh, <laughs> I don't, it's not very controllable, but it is rideable. Uh -huh. And then we have all of the NPCs. So if I go into, we've already done this and it ships with all of these things in it. But if we go into the NPCs, and this is all about, again, creating narratives. So the kids can go in and they can choose from all of the Viking gods. So there's Odin, for example, um, uh, the All Father. And then they can create their own narrative. And that might be Freya, for example. Uh, and they can, oh, it's free, isn't it? There we go. So I can have, you can, the kids can add the gods and they can add their own narratives and so on. We also have, if we get some iron blocks, I'll finish on this. Uh, and we also get a pumpkin. And we go one, two, three, four. And if we add the top, we get a troll. Um, and you can go find trolls under bridges, etc. So really what we try to do as a company, and I'll, I'll just finish on the statement, is we just try to build relevant, meaningful, uh, enga truly engaging Minecraft experiences that are, that are built on environment, narrative, uh, sorry, structures and mechanics, and ultimately narrative. Give children something to follow and something to be a part of and something to question. Um, and I'd, say, I'd say mission mission accomplished. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Um, details, if anybody's interested in our worlds, thank you so much for watching. We, you know, this is how we get what we do out there. So thanks to Mike and Steve for this time. Um, if anybody's interested, our details will be um, disseminated via Steve and Mike.
Yeah, and, and Stephen will be joining us again this afternoon um, at, well, it's 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern on the Esports Fed Twitch channel. Uh, so if you missed part of this, want to see a, another take on it, uh, please join us. I'll also be posting it on the YouTube channel, uh, and I'll be tweeting that out and all. And tomorrow, um, we have Professor Eric uh, joining us, and we're going to start talking about a series of Minecraft build cha challenges um, that'll span the next couple of weeks while a lot of us are at home. Um, so we're really trying to create opportunities for for kids and, and communities to come together and learn together yeah. and all. And I could not be more grateful, um, you know, for Stephen joining us this morning. This was absolutely amazing. I, I feel uh, like I get the the privilege and honor of learning you know this awesome stuff yeah. um and i i never ever pass up an opportunity to hang out with steven so i do thank you and thank and you. this is it's like it's like four or five in the morning there so let's give him some love for for getting but up so that's damn not really morning. true that's not no, really true 2, but... 2 p.m what is it oh it's the afternoon i'm thinking i'm going backwards instead of yeah, forward. yeah, yeah. that's yeah. all right that's all right it's, oh, it's gonna be a little it's gonna be a little bit later tonight than when you're on yeah. He would have gotten do, up at two in the do morning. Do follow me on Twitter, us. though, um, because I put a lot of stuff out on Twitter about what I'm doing and what's coming next and where to get my stuff. So that would be at Immersive Mind. We have um, that somewhere. Or at Fidgetal Labs. Absolutely. Thanks, folks. You guys have a great day, everyone. Stay thank safe. You, I'll see you later. See you in a bit. Yeah. Bye, everyone. I, thank you.